afternoon and welcome to our lunch. And I sincerely appreciate your interest, most of all being here to share with us the launch of this new sustainable trade index. First of all, though, let me thank those individuals responsible for the research, its development, and its production. The Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU, was commissioned to carry out the research. Chris Clegg, Barrett Bingley, David Lyon were assigned to the project. They've done an absolute fantastic job in a most professional way and had indeed stayed the course. Let me share it with you. A little difficult. This was a tough project and I'm very happy they did stay the course. So gentlemen, in recognition, may I ask everyone a big round of applause. Also, I would like to recognize Catherine Dios and Steve Olson, who are members of the Heinrich Foundation, for their efforts and their engagement in ensuring that the product was reached this stage. So you may ask why. Why did we produce this index on sustainable trade? Well, this is why. Asia has realized substantial economic growth and benefited through participation in international trade, in exports and imports, and certainly in the service industry. And it is true, whether you are referencing Japan, or Tigers, or the new economic powerhouse China, each country was able to literally kickstart their economies through aggressively participating in international trade. And none of these economies, certainly not the consumers or the business sector or governments, wish to lose those benefits that were so hard won. However, if we are going to maintain these benefits, these trade benefits, and they must be sustained, and as a point, should not be taken for granted. But before I go into that, I'd like to just share with you a few of the outstanding examples that I regard as incredible benefits to Asia in particular. Those being, number one, being the reduction of poverty. Levels previously thought totally impossible. And please remember the importance of this one single achievement. Next to slavery or imprisonment, the most degrading condition of any human being is that of poverty. So the progress in this area has truly been stunning, to say the least. Second, we have also seen a rapid improvement in healthcare across Asia, very significant. And just one data point on that is the infant mortality rate has substantially declined. Third, we have seen environmental degradation in a number of countries, but we've also seen recovery. Unfortunately, there are those countries that remain deeply buried in a deplorable state of pollution. In this index, we have included and compared 19 Asian countries. Some of them are large, Others are small. We've also included economies relatively new to the area of trade development. And we've also included the U.S. as a benchmark. This sustainable trade index focuses on three criteria required for any, any economy to ultimately become sustainable. And that is the state of the economy, the environment that is provided, and the development of its social capital. You may think of these criteria as somewhat of a three-legged stool, and it's important for balance for those legs to be consistent, and they be the same length, of course. We plan to, every two years, to renew this index. Over the last year, we have studied, uh, we have studied and researched which indicators provide both the best scope and best depth for each of the three criteria. 
We have included data that has been provided by the individual countries, and we have included a number of international indices. And Chris will go into far more detail that, on that in just a moment. We do not judge government policy. We are not taking issue or providing any form of policy guidance. We provide an index referencing a country's status. In balancing these criteria I've mentioned above, each country will have indeed achieved their ranking with different policies, with different programs, and with different approaches. At the private level, we hope that this document will assist businessmen in better identifying areas in with which they may be interested in investing. It's obviously certainly desirable to be focusing on those countries that have a policy and that they have process or progress in balancing their trade. We also trust that this index will serve students and certainly academia. For over 50 years, I have had the absolute privilege, the pleasure, and the excitement of being deeply involved in the development of trade in Asia, both east and west, and certainly within Asia. I have worked in trade development over those years in every country from Japan to Pakistan. And what I have witnessed in economic development has been absolutely nothing but amazing, and probably more accurately stated, somewhat of a miracle. And to protect those benefits that I, for one, sincerely hope that every country will seek to achieve that critical balance required between their economic development, their environmental situation, and their capital, their social capital. So we trust that this index will prove both interesting and helpful to each and every one of you. And may I now hand over the podium to Chris from EIU, who will walk you through the results of this year's index. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly uh, about me while you do so, uh, I'm a senior editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, before I joined the EIU, uh, I worked at a small consulting firm in Tokyo and uh, helped to advise uh, certain ministries in the Japanese government on trade policy and the contents of free trade agreements. Um, since I've moved over to the EIU, I've worked on a variety of trade projects, uh, including this one, uh, and I also spent some time studying at the World Trade Institute. Um, so like Mr. Heinrich, uh, I have uh, an intense interest in the, in the issue. Um, I'm going to start talking today briefly about how we came to define sustainable trade and the definition. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the methodology um, and keeping that mercifully brief. Um, how we develop the three pillars, how we develop the, uh, the indicators beneath them. Talk a little bit about the country selection. Mr. Heinrich touched on that a bit already. Uh, and then I'll end up with some of the features uh, of the workbook itself uh, before moving on to the, the results of the index. Um, so the concept of sustainability is generally associated with the environment, with environmental stewardship. Um, and sometimes more broadly with the process of economic development. Both of those are important, we recognize that, um, and we of course took them into account when we were developing this index. Um, but the object objective of this project was to uh, bridge a gap that we saw, an important gap, uh, by incorporating uh, trade uh, into, into the equation. Um, trade having been so instrumental in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the last two, three, four decades, uh, and having the potential to continue lifting people out of poverty or poverty, provided that uh, trade uh, remains sustainable. Um, so with that in mind, we developed uh, this definition of what constitutes sustainable trade. So I'll just read it. Sustainable trade is participating in the international trading system in a manner that supports the long-term domestic and global goals of economic growth, environmental protection, and strengthening social capital. Um, a few notes on the definition. Uh, Long, the reason long-term uh, domestic and global goals is emphasized in this, is emphasized in this definition uh, is because, as is well known, 
certain types of domestic policies that relate to trade um, can be unsupportive to the international trading system. And I think Steve Olson will talk about those a little bit uh, in the subsequent presentation. Um, the other aspect of the definition I feel I should point out is, is strengthening social capital. Uh, environmental protection and environmental stewardship I think are pretty well known and pretty well defined by this point. But what we mean by strengthening social capital um, is improving education, reducing inequality, uh, enhancing political stability, having high labor standards. Those, those are the four uh, areas that we looked at, uh, the four areas that we take into consideration uh, when we talk about strengthening social capital. Um, next slide. Uh, so I already mentioned there's three pillars to the index. Um, economic, or what we call in the paper the profit pillar. Uh, the social pillar, or what we call the people pillar in the, in the paper. And of course the environmental pillar, which we call planet. Um, so the EIU has developed a number of successful indexes over the, over the years, and, and we generally follow the same approach for each. Uh, in this case, the definition and the framework you're looking at here uh, were arrived at at roughly the same time uh, and are based on a seminal report um, out of the UN by the Brundtland Commission um, on sustainable development called Our Common Future. Um, in that report, they developed what is now the widely accepted uh, triple bottom line accounting for measuring uh, and tracking sustainable development. We took that uh, framework and we've adapted it to purposes here uh, to, to measure uh, sustainable trade. Um, following that, my colleagues and I conducted a thorough literature review. Um, so besides myself and Dave and Barrett, who were mentioned by name, there were two other two or three other people um, that were on the team, including the, the EIU's chief economist. Um, when we were going through literally hundreds of academic uh, pieces on these topics, economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental su sustainability. We were looking for three things. Of course, relevance to sustainability in one of those pillars. Uh, availability of data, obviously that's key. If, you, if there's no data, you can't measure it, it can't go in an index. Uh, and parsimony, uh, which, which uh, data sets, which variables, which indicators have the, the most explanatory power. Um, then we consulted internal and expert, uh, internal and external experts, arriving at the final indicators. So, uh, just as way of background, the economic pillar has 14 indicators. The social pillar, as I already said, has four, and the environmental uh, pillar has six sub-indicators. And, and I'll talk about each one of this, the, the pillars uh, after I discuss the overall overall results. Um, two more notes on methodology uh, before I get into the results. Um, why Asia? Uh, Mr. Heinrich already explained this to a certain extent. Uh, Asia is home to two of the three largest economies in the world and the two most populous nations. So it makes it an obvious place to start with an inaugural run of the index. Um, the other factor we considered in selecting Asia uh, is it, more than any other region in the world, it demonstrates the power of trade to raise people out of poverty. Um, and I think that's been emphasized once or twice already and will probably be em emphasized once again in Stephen's presentation. Um, and then finally, the U.S. is included as an external benchmark. And then the final note on methodology is um, at the end of this presentation, you'll be uh, directed to a website where you can download the data workbook and the model that was used to create this index. Um, what we've done here is all of these pillars economic, social, and environmental, are weighted equally. So 33.3% for economic, social, environmental. There are four social indicators, each one 25% and so on. What the workbook allows you to do uh, when you download it is to play around with different weight sets. You can overweight one indicator, underweight uh, another indicator. You can overweight one pillar, you can underweight another pillar. Um, we've stuck with the baseline even uh, equal weighting system because there was no academic uh, literature that supported unequal weightings. Uh, but we recognize there are certain arguments for doing so. So I encourage you all to download the workbook. Uh, the overall results of the, the index, uh, left to right, obviously the tall bar is scoring better, uh, down to the right uh, and the lowest scores. Singapore tops the index, uh, followed closely by South Korea and Japan. Uh, after that, there's a slight drop down to the U.S. and Hong Kong. Um, 
and then larger drops to Taiwan and Malaysia. Malaysia <laughs> being uh, the best performing uh, emerging country in Asia in the index. Um, that Singapore ranks first is perhaps unsurprising. Um, as we explained in the report, uh, Singapore has some unique characteristics uh, that make it predisposed to benefit from trade. Geography, population, uh, location, and so on. And no country really in the index uh, is able to match the benefits it's delivered over the last 50 years um, in the course of targeted economic policy, environmental, and uh, uh, social capital stewardship. Um, that South and Southeast Asian countries rank somewhat lower uh, on the index is perhaps equally as unsurprising. Um, we should say that each one of these countries has the potential to trade more sustainably as we define it. Um, but most of them are held back by a few core reasons or a number of, of peripheral reasons. Uh, whether it's uh, poor export diversification uh, or under, underdeveloped social capital. Um, most of you will notice that the bottom of the ranking uh, is Myanmar. Myanmar pre presents a, a particularly interesting case in the context of this index, uh, specifically because it has just opened up to the global economy in the last couple of years, um, and more recently uh, it, it elected a new democratic government. Uh, it remains to be seen what that government will be able to accomplish, um, but we do hope that this index and other work of its kind will help uh, policymakers in that country uh, pr pr pursue a path of sustainable development. Um, you'll notice, of course, that these results correlate pretty clearly with levels of income. Uh, that's somewhat to be expected. Uh, indexes like these and others tend to do that. Um, but what we've done is we've added another layer of analysis here, uh, looking at how countries perform relative to their level of income. Um, so that's what's shown on this table. So what we have here in red uh, are the countries that un underperform relative to their per capita GDP. So for example, I'll highlight China. If you look at China here, which sorry, ranks uh, ninth in terms of per capita GDP, but 12th in the index, uh, underperforms by three places in the index. And I'll get back to China in a moment. Um, so the, the notable overperformers in the index um, are South Korea, which comes in number two uh, on the index, in the index, uh, but ranks sixth in per capita GDP. Vietnam, which overperforms by three places by the same measure, uh, and Cambodia, which also overperforms by three. Um, South Korea, which ranks uh, first in the social pillar, uh, scoring well in education and its level of inequality as measured by the, the Gini coefficient. Um, it's third in the economic pillar, uh, having low costs to trade, uh, which we define as uh, the quality of the infrastructure, the quality of the, uh, the legal structure, uh, and, and other factors, and strong levels of technological innovation. It's also fourth in the environmental pillar, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Vietnam's overperformance uh, is the result of factors like uh, its export diversification. Uh, in terms of the variety of, of markets that it exports to. Um, we assume a greater variety or a greater diversification is a plus for sustainability of that country's trade regime. Um, it also comes forth in foreign direct investment, uh, which is a number we might even expect to rise on the next iteration of the index, considering that all of the money that seems to be flowing into Vietnam um, of late. And then the growth in the labor force. Um, Vietnam is currently in sort of the demographic sweet spot um, for attracting FDI into manufacturing. The most notable underperformer uh, is China, as I already mentioned, although Brunei is the largest underperformer by six places. Um, I think in this room, China will be more interest. Um, China comes in 15th in the environmental pillar, uh, 12th in the social pillar, uh, and 8th in the economic pillar. China has benefited, I think inarguably, has benefited the most from global trade over the last 20 or 30 years. So when we speak of hundreds of millions being lifted out of poverty by trade, many of those hundreds of millions are actually in China. I think more arguably, its entrance into the global trading system has affected the sustainability of the global system. Um, 
but we'll leave that discussion for, for another time. The current government has uh, appeared to acknowledge some of the issues it faces uh, in this area. Uh, of course, it remains to be seen whether that acknowledgement will actually translate into, into action. Um, so moving on, uh, the, the first we'll start with the economic pillar. So the countries here, uh, there are 14 indicators. The countries here tend to have low barriers to trade. So that's not only tariffs, but non-tariff barriers. Uh, a diversified export mix, which we've already talked about in the context of Vietnam. Um, and open current accounts. So those just three or four of the indicators out of the 14. Uh, again, I encourage you to, to look at the, the workbook and the methodology appendix at the back of the, the white page. Um, as already highlighted, Malaysia uh, is the best performer from uh, emerging Asia. Um, it's among a group of countries that EIU analysts score well in terms of its non-tariff uh, barriers and its tariff barriers. Uh, and like South Korea, it, it has low trade costs and is doing fairly well in technological innovation and technological infrastructure. Um, Vietnam, again, is the country to watch here. Um, besides the diversified export mix, uh, the demographic sweet spot, the FDI, um, Vietnam is also a party to a number of uh, free trade agreements, including the TPP, potentially the RCEP agreement uh, coming down the pipeline. And this will uh, expose Vietnam to disciplines in areas like environmental and labor standards that could ultimately help it uh, maintain greater trade sustainability in those, those two areas. Um, Myanmar, again, at the bottom, an interesting case in that it's a blank slate. Um, it's starting from the bottom. Um, so the newly elected government gives some hope in this area, um, but we hope countries like Myanmar um, can draw important lessons from this when they're shaping, shaping their policy. Sorry. Um, moving on to the social pillar. Countries that score here have, score well here have lower inequality, lower levels of inequality, strong labor standards, uh, are politically stable, uh, <coughs> and uh, give their citizens access to good education, quality education. Um, South Korea here ranks first or second in, those, in three of those categories, but ranks eighth in political st stability, which is somewhat low, lower than you would expect given its, its level of income. I think the most interesting case here is, is the U.S. So U.S. comes second in the index, uh, in this pillar of the index, uh, and does quite well in labor standards, um, education, uh, and political stability, at least for now. Um, I think we can imagine some scenarios where our analysts might have to revise their estimates there. Um, so where it does poorly is inequality. <clears throat> it ranks just behind Vietnam and just ahead of Thailand. I think this is an important uh, fact to highlight uh, because there is an argument to be made, I think, uh, a very logical argument, that inequality deserves to be overweighted in this category. Again, we didn't do it, <clears throat> but uh, we encourage you to use the workbook and see what it would be like if inequality was given a 50% rating and the other indicators were underweighted. And it's important, and Steve will get into this, uh, because inequality has led uh, to a rising tide of populism, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere. Um, populism directed at very real levels of inequality, um, and inequality that some people are pinning fairly or unfairly on participation in the international trading system. And Steve, Steve will discuss that in a little bit. The last point I want to make on the social pillar is with regards to the participation of the private sector and what they can do to help maintain trade sustainability for the countries in, in this index and other countries around the world. Um, the subject of labor standards, I think, has been on people's minds for a long time, uh, although the amount of attention that it gets paid tends to ebb and flow. Um, since the, the building collapse of DACA in 2013, uh, our interviews and research show that more and more companies are, are paying attention to the integrity and transparency of their supply chains. And the better they do that, we think the more sustainable trade in those countries and all countries will, be, will become. Um, 
Interestingly, as well, the private sector is getting involved in education um, and training. You could argue for selfish reasons, because they want to ensure that the workforce of the future meets their needs. Um, but of course it has knock-on effects on the, on the larger country's uh, ability to trade sustainably. So there are two short case studies in the paper. Uh, one is on the Noble Group, um, the Hong Kong listed resources company. Um, they've been directly in, uh, funding uh, school educational infrastructure uh, and teacher training in a number of less developed communities where they operate. Likewise, Samsung has created a smart school initiative or program uh, to provide uh, vocational training and job placement opportunities to students all over the world, not just in Asia, uh, but in, especially in the countries they operate in Asia. Um, the, the last slide here before I uh, yield the floor to Steve um, is the environmental pillar. So the best performers here avoid over-reliance on natural resource exports, have low carbon emissions in trade, and are party to most important international agreements related to trade and the environment. Hong Kong comes number one, so I'll wait for a collective gasp before I continue. Um, and emphasize that this is a sustainable trade index. Okay, so it's focused on the sustainability of trade and the environment. Um, Hong Kong is a trade hub. It's a trading hub. Uh, it's a logistics center with few natural resources of its own, a good record on reforestation, which is one of the indicators we include in the index, uh, and ranks uh, only second behind Singapore in, level, in, in levels of water pollution. And we use the Yale Environmental Performance Index for, for some of those indicators. Um, on top of that, it's party to all seven international trade agreements related to the environment. Um, and uh, there are instances where companies have been um, self-imposing standards, such as the shipping industry, which is self-imposed standards on low emissions fuels. Um, the last point I'll make here, um, overall, on the environment, is um, the trade agreements I spoke of have the ability, not just the TPP, uh, but the RCEP and other, other agreements have the potential to uh, assist in improvements in the environment and labor and, and elsewhere. I think specifically with the TPP, uh, there's been some disappointments in the stringency of the uh, disciplines that were contained. Um, but the researchers we spoke to in the course of uh, doing interviews for the white paper said that these agreements, even if they don't meet up to expectations, nevertheless provide an important framework uh, for moving ahead uh, on uh, environmental labor standards and other standards that are related to trading sustainability. So with that, uh, thank you for listening, and I will uh, bring Steve Olson up here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start off just by taking a, a brief moment to introduce myself. Uh, as Barrett mentioned, I'm a research fellow with the Heinrich Foundation. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, my career started in Washington, D.C. many, many, many uh, years ago, more years ago than I would care to admit, actually, as a U.S. trade negotiator. And I was a member of the U.S. negotiating team for the NAFTA negotiations and the U.S.-Canada free trade uh, agreement before that. Um, since my days in Washington, my career has been based primarily in Asia and the Middle East, where I've had a variety of positions in the private sector, think tanks, and uh, NGOs. In addition to my uh, position with the Heinrich Foundation here in Hong Kong, I'm also a visiting scholar at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Okay, so let's, let's, let's jump in on the policy implications. Um, now that Chris has provided us with a good overview on the construction of the index uh, and the overall results that it produced, I'd like to say a few words about the policy implications that the index seems to point us towards. Um, to be clear, however, and this is a very, very important point that I want to stress, it is not our intention to give specific policy prescriptions to individual countries. But we believe that the index does uh, point us towards a number of broad themes that we think will be very useful for policymakers to at least consider as they chart their path forward. So the first theme that I'd like to mention 
theme number one is that sustainable trade is a marathon, not a sprint, okay? In order to be a successful, sustainable trade nation, policymakers need to approach trade with the perspective of a marathon runner, not a sprinter. In essence, the index is telling us trade, yes, but not at all costs. The challenge is to think strategically about trade over the long term while avoiding the temptation of short-term payoffs that undermine trade sustainability over the longer term. As an example, building an export strategy around a non-renewable resource while failing to make sufficient investments in education that can create a skilled labor force capable of moving up the value chain would seriously undermine the country's ability to engage sustainably in trade. So policymakers will need to carefully balance short-term and long-term imperatives and evaluate the trade-offs. Now, while we understand that uh, trade is an important ingredient in economic growth and development, we also understand that trade can bring with it potential risks, things like labor market dislocations, um, potentially exacerbated income inequality, environmental costs, and sometimes also be brought along with trade. But with the right policies, these risks can be reduced and can be managed, and trade can be conducted on a more sustainable basis. So the key question we believe for policymakers to ask themselves is this, are the policies that we're putting in place today setting up our country to trade successfully five years, 10 years, and even 15 years into the future? Remember, sustainable trade, it is a marathon, not a sprint. The second theme that I'd like to mention, theme number two, is sustainability supports development. Developing sustainable trade practices support rather than undermine overall economic development strategies and objectives. These objectives should not be seen as being in opposition to each other. Now this was a point that came to very, very clearly, and, and perhaps some of you have already taken a look at this publication, uh, but the World Bank recently issued its economic update for East Asia and the Pacific. And interestingly enough, the World Bank recommended that in order to spur growth and development, countries in the region should make investments in a variety of public goods, things like education, things like health care and social safety nets, while at the same time pursuing greater income equality and greater environmental stewardship. Now remember, these are precisely the types of issues that Chris just described for us under the uh, economic, social, and environmental pillars. And in the view of the World Bank, at least, investing in these areas are going to be critical to the growth and the development of the region. Now, the recommendations from the World Bank in this recent publication also happen to dovetail very nicely uh, with uh, some work that has come out of the OECD, in which the OECD has called for countries to pursue um, greater um, uh, uh, policy coherence, mutually supportive <coughs> policies across the economic, uh, social, and environmental pillars. Now, look, we fully recognize, we fully recognize that there will occasionally be trade-offs among these pillars but there will also be opportunities for mutually supportive policies, or what the OECD would recall, um, or what the OECD would call policy coherence across these three pillars. So the bottom line for policymakers is this. Sustainable trade should be seen as part of and supportive of your overall economic development programs and goals. The third theme that I'd like to mention Theme three, use FTAs to bolster sustainability. To the extent possible, governments in the region should work towards more meaningful 
labor and environmental provisions in free trade agreements, in regional trade agreements, and in multilateral uh, trade agreements. As this happens, we will build greater trade sustainability into global supply chains and into economic regions. Now, we've got to acknowledge, we've got to recognize that many of the existing uh, labor and environment provisions in existing free trade agreements, quite frankly, leave a lot to be desired. Okay, they're still in many respects modest. But the point is, gradual progress is being made. We're heading in the right direction, and this progress needs to be continued. As that happens, free trade agreements and regional trade agreements will actually become instruments of greater trade sustainability in the region. The fourth theme that I'd like to mention, the rest of the world is watching. The rest of the world is watching. What am I talking about? Multilateral development agencies evaluate very closely the sustainable trade policies of countries when determining where they should place their aid packages and other forms of assistance and capacity building. Okay, they look at these issues very closely. And it's not only the MDA, it's not only the multilateral development agencies, it's also foreign corporations. Foreign corporations look at a lot of the same issues that Chris discussed under the economic, social, and environmental pillar when making decisions about where to invest their resources. Now, we all understand there's a, a, vari a variety of ways that FDI is beneficial, but one of the most profound impacts that FDI has is as a means of encouraging the ability of developing countries to engage in trade and to move up the economic development ladder. So, the key point here is that by pursuing sustainable trade practices, you are making your country more attractive, both to multilateral development agencies and to FDI providers. This helps spur the development of a virtuous cycle where we have more trade, more growth, more investment, and greater capacity being built. Those are the, those are the key themes that we believe have emerged um, from the index. I'd like to now um, just share with you a few uh, general observations. Um, as I'm sure every person in this room recognizes as well as I do, trade has really been a remarkable engine of economic and growth, of economic growth and development over the past six or even uh, seven decades. Um, trade has been responsible for lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and raising quality of life and standard of living everywhere from Latin America to East Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa and to every place in between. But meeting under, at the time that we're meeting, releasing this index, at the time that we're releasing this index, we have to recognize a simple fact. And that is, despite the benefits that I think everybody in this room recognizes that international trade brings, support for international trade has been dropping precipitously in many countries. We now have a situation in which average citizens, both in developed and developing countries, are increasingly questioning whether or not trade, quote unquote, works for them. And even in the United States, uh, a traditional bastion of support for free trade, we see some very disturbing trends and we see some very sharp drop-offs in support for free trade. I don't know if, you, uh, if any of you happen to notice it, but there was a recent Bloomberg poll which indicated that for the first time in recent memory, a majority of Americans, and I think it was closer to two-thirds of Americans, actually support increasing rather than reducing restrictions on imported products. This is the first time that this has happened in, in, in memory, and it's a very noteworthy uh, change in sentiment that we all should be aware of. Now, of course, uh, this, this change in public mood, this change in public sentiment is reflected in the rhetoric that we see on the campaign trail in the U.S. presidential election. 
where we have most of the remaining candidates range from being trade skeptical at one end to being outright protectionists at the other end, reflecting the mood of the electorate. Now, various criticisms have been raised about international trade. Some of these are valid, some of these are not valid. But it's very interesting to think that much of this trade discontent relates to the fact that we haven't done a good enough job yet in addressing many of the issues that Chris was talking about under the economic, the social, and the environmental pillar. So, by trading more sustainably, by addressing these types of issues, we can at least hope that we can garner greater civil society support for free trade and help endure the ongoing viability of the trade system, which I know all the people in this room certainly recognize has been an immensely um, uh, valuable engine of growth and development uh, for the world. Now, the, the final point that I want to make, and it's, it's to um, echo some points that have been made uh, earlier today, is that we, we really view the launch of this index as an invitation to dialogue. We view it as a platform for further discussion on issues related to uh, trade sustainability, and we are very, very, very sincere in our desire to receive your input, thoughts, and suggestions on the index. So at today's luncheon, we're certainly now going to have an opportunity for some discussion, some questions, and some comments, but I want to make it clear, and make it clear in a very sincere way, that we would welcome the opportunity to meet with any of you and to have a further discussion on the index, get into the details more deeply, and uh, receive your input and your feedback. We don't pretend for one minute that we have all the answers, and we very much appreciate uh, your, your input and your feedback. Uh, with that, I'll draw my comments to, to a close, and we can move on to some questions and dialogue. Thank you very much. Right, we have one question. Uh, hand up very fast, please, sir. Um, the, um, the index uh, shows uh, that Hong Kong, also you rightly pointed out, is on top of the environmental list. Now, this shows that the, um, the index uh, needs to address the fact that in trade, everything is embedded. Uh, we are, we, like it or not, we are in a globalized, interconnected, and interdependent world. So if you measure trade from Hong Kong, obviously you don't find a lot of energy input, uh, but anti um, uh, goods exported through Hong Kong would embed a lot of energy or resource inputs from other places. So that happens around the world. So, uh, in fact, this is the, uh, uh, becomes even more so uh, as the Davos uh, World Economic Forum um, calls it the fourth industrial revolution, which everything is connected to everything. So, my question to you is that uh, to what extent uh, would your index uh, be able to address this issue when there is a lot of things that there is a, a lot of me and you and you and me that kind of thing, a phenomenon? A phenomenon. So just looking at trade statistics may not be able to tell the full story. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I'll take that one. Um, so there is, I don't know if you've had a chance to flip to the back of the methodology document yet yeah, to look at the indicators, but there is an indicator for carbon emissions in trade. Uh, and I think that's from UNCTAD. Uh, I don't quite remember, but it will be in there. Um, if you're referring to Hong Kong's place as a transshipment hub and the amount of goods that, that flow through here, um, yes, that's fair enough. We didn't, we didn't capture that, and I don't know how you could possibly capture that. Um, and Hong Kong certainly does bear some responsibility because it certainly profits from its position as a transshipment hub, right? There's every container that comes through, X amount of dollars accrue to the port, the port operators and, and whatnot. Um, I would say that we, we hope to capture things like that in environmental standards and trade. Um, and and uh, the standards that Hong Kong holds itself to international agreements. Um, but at the same time, I have to recognize and admit there are some difficulties in capturing. I don't know that anybody's really captured um, the, the best way to measure the, the contributions that transshipment hubs and transshipments in general uh, make towards uh, environmental degradation. So thank you for the question. Yeah, I, if I Sorry, can, yeah, please. We, we wanted to be very sure that the index was built on solid data. Uh, 
rather than judgment. And there isn't always quality data, data available for any or all of the countries. So that sometimes is an issue we have to deal with. It seems to me that some of the negatives for the, that are being blamed on trade are actually coming from um, use of creative technology and technological change. Did you guys look at that at all? Uh, we didn't. Um, this is a short answer. Um, because I'm not sure that there's a definitive, just to go back a little bit to the methodology, um, the indicators that were included in the index needed to be supported by conclusive studies and literature. And I think the fact that you asked that question, you probably recognize that there are no, there is no conclusion, conclusive uh, uh, findings on the debate between globalization and technology. And the argument is probably that there is a little of A and a little of, of B. Um, but because, uh, and this, because there was no conclusive findings in the academic literature, and thus no way to include an indicator to measure that, we, we couldn't, unfortunately, include it in the index. Um, hopefully that won't be the case for the second running of this. Uh, hopefully by then somebody will have developed a way to measure it. But as it stands now, there, there's, there's simply no way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No. Julia Brickhill from International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank Group. And this is wonderful to hear and to see this research. You can imagine from our perspective, I feel like I'm coming home. <laughs> this is uh, stuff that, that we regard as absolutely important. And also, kudos for really the focus on sustaining um, on inequality, which of course um, is the, has the potential to be such a dividing force and actually to undo so much of, of uh, the progress that we have made. Um, my question is actually about another force that uh, could, uh, that we are very worried about that uh, could undo all of that progress, which is climate change. And I was interested. I heard your point that you just made about the fact that uh, this is uh, based on uh, documented work and things that you can actually count. But how do you anticipate that you might be able to take into account some of the impacts of climate change, particularly on trade and global supply chains, um, in the in future indexes? Um, and like technology is, is a very important point to trade sustainability. Um, and uh, I guess the, the short answer is that we do have some indicators in there that take into account the contribution that countries make uh, to climate change in the form of uh, carbon emissions and trade, natural resource exports as a percentage of overall trade, air pollution, water pollution. So those are, and I think, um, a number of countries, including China, provide very good examples of this, is those are not, even the domestic results of those are not, um, they're not exclusive. There's obviously spillover effects from what China does in terms of climate onto the surrounding countries and, and the, um, the, the globe. I mean, the only way that I can think of is for the next index, at, off the top of my head, is something that comes out of the re recent uh, agreement in Paris and some sort of uh, disciplines that countries have sex, uh, um, subjected them themselves to and whether they adhere to those. Um, as for the supply chain issue, I think there's a lot of stresses on supply chains right now. Um, the climate change is one of them. Uh, labor is another one that I mentioned. Um, this, this concept of the, the fourth industrial revolution and whether or not that's going to result in more uh, uh, research. There's a lot of factors involved. I don't know that climate change is the biggest one of those. It's certainly a factor. Uh, I wouldn't dispute that. Uh, but I, I'm not sure uh, among a host of four or five factors that it's the most important. Uh, but I'd be willing to hear you push back on that uh, afterwards. Hi, I'm Linda John with the Canadian Consulate General. And, um, Thanks as well for the presentation. I have a very uh, a, a simple question, which is um, a few references to this being the first edition of the index and starting with Asia. So my question is, given the global nature of trade, has there been some thought given to expanding the index to include, for example, uh, North, South America, Europe? Thank you. I, I think that's certainly a good possibility. This this was the first edition. Uh, we wanted to limit it to Asia, but certainly as we went through the process, we saw that there could be tremendous uh, value added by adding countries in the future. So I think by the time we get to uh, our future editions, that might be something you can expect to see. Uh, I'm Rico from the Malaysian uh, Office. Uh, sorry, I didn't go to your methodology yet. Uh, you want your weightage on uh, multilateral uh, agreements, 
because uh, uh, we are uh, ASEAN is now conducting the FTA uh, with uh, Hong Kong, which is undergoing. And your economic pillar, your ranking is basically the starting point of the, the FTA mm. on on uh, trade barriers, non non trade barriers. So uh, it, it seems that we become better with more multilateral uh, trade agreements. Uh, but uh, what is the weightage here? Okay, so that's a very good question. I'll let Steve follow up because I'm sure he has something to say on this. Um, one of the reasons that we didn't include the number of FTAs that a country signs is because there's no single agreed metric for measuring the quality of those FTAs, right? Steve alluded this to this in his, in his presentation. Um, some FTAs are far better than others, um, far more aggressive in their pursuit of, of liberalization, far more aggressive in the standards that they impose on the signatories. Um, so not to, not to lean on this crutch a little bit too much, but there was simply no way to measure that. Uh, we did include uh, in, in participation in environmental, uh, international environmental agreements related to trade. Um, this is something to consider for the next iteration of the index, but I mean, I don't know, and Steve can speak to this, if there is a, uh, a singular way that you can measure the quality of all of these hundreds of FTAs that countries have signed over the last decade plus. Yeah, I think, you know, the, 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 the simple answer is that all FTAs are not created equal. Okay, so because a country has 18 FTAs and another country has three FTAs, that doesn't necessarily imply a greater level of openness. So until we can come up with some metric, some indicator that can satisfactorily kind of distinguish between the higher quality and the lower quality FTAs, I don't think that's something we'll be able to include, but it's an absolutely valid point. Um, and actually, I will follow up with you. A couple of years ago, we did some research on free trade agreements for a very large bank that happens to print the money in your pocket um, on whether or not they were actually useful uh, for medium-sized exporters. Could they use them? Did they understand them? This sort of thing. So we can send that to you as well. Okay. Um, during your presentation, you've commented quite a bit on China and its position both across the whole index and in the pillars. Uh, there is another major economy in the region in the form of India. Um, I was wondering whether you'd like to make some comments about its relative ratings to China in the index and the drivers behind both those economies and sustainable trade? It's a very fair question. Um, so, off the top of my head, I believe India scores, definitely scores worse than the environmental pillar. Um, and I think it probably scores worse than China and all of the pillars. In the, the, the place of analysis to start with with India is that it has let a massive opportunity pass, its, pass by up until this point. Um, it hasn't been engaging in the world trade system in a, even a meaningful way, let alone a sustainable one, and certainly not relative to its potential capacity. Um, so I would say that although it's not as far down, I'm certainly not as far down on the scale as a country like Myanmar, for example, it's one of those countries that can take a look at this index and, and learn quite a bit from what's come before or how the wealthier countries have gotten to where they've gotten in terms of trade sustainability. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. And, and I think that's one, one of our primary objectives in putting out the index. It's, it's an opportunity for countries to look at what other countries have done and make judgments about whether or not it may or may not be applicable and useful for them. Certainly, we hope that will be the case for India and other countries as well. Dave Cook from HKUSD. I was wondering how important that you think that trade and services are as part of a sustainable, a sustainable trade strategy. And maybe specifically, if we were looking at your workbook, which of the indicators do you think uh, if within your index would best reflect on a country's uh, ability to position itself in trade and services, professional, business services, etc. Sure, education and the social pillar. And education and the social pillar would be the one that we would look at for that um, uh, in the context of this index. I think the, in, the services example is an interesting one, and I'll allow Steve to weigh in here too. Um, because it, it asks the question of whether or not countries can continue to move up the value chain, the traditional level or path of development for countries that get from agriculture, manufacturing, to services. Um, but to sort of circle back to the initial question on technology and the impact that that's had, um, and, and we don't know exactly yet, 
uh, but certainly has an impact on the efficiency of the services sector. Is that going to hurt the ability of some countries to enter the world trading system? Is it going to kick the ladder out, so to speak? Um, and I think that's certainly something that we would need to pick up on for the next, uh, next iteration of the index. But if you're looking for something that's most related to the ability of a country to move into services, it's got to be education. And, and that's certainly a path that we've seen some of the more successful countries in the index follow. Ronnie Chan of Asia Society, two questions. First one I want to ask, second one I don't want to ask. First one I was just asked my last guy, so the question I don't want to ask. And page 13 says low uh, income country uh, was Cambodia, uh, but on page 14 the lowest was in Myanmar. So is this what's going on? Uh, I'll have to take a look at that. We use the World Bank classifications for classifying those countries into the four buckets, and the data we used was from the EIU database. So we wanted to use the World Bank classifications because it's the accepted classification, but being the EIU, EIU we use the EIU per capita GDP number, so that, would have, that might account for the difference. I'll have to go back and look, but fair question. Uh, I have a question, but it's not a methodology question. Um, I was going to ask you, um, you know, where kind of rule of law comes in, and having looked at the uh, indicators, I see that it's kind of buried in the uh, economic pillar. Uh, but it's one of 16, 18 uh, indicators. Um, and what struck me was that if you look at the social pillar and the environmental pillar, there are only four uh, indicators um, each under those categories. Um, I think that reflects a, a few possible things. One is kind of the lack of good data by which to um, measure performance uh, under these um, two uh, pillows. Um, and that could be um, simply that we don't have them, they're difficult to, to measure. Um, uh, I mean, I have to say that you know, this is kind of balanced out by the fact that you give equal weight to each of the pillars, which I think is wonderful. Um, I mean, personally, I probably would have made the case that you want uh, a higher allocation or higher, uh, uh, heavier weight into the environmental pillar just because if we don't have the money, we don't have anything else. Um, but putting that aside, um, how do you feel about kind of flushing out um, in the future uh, kind of these, uh, the social pillar and the environmental pillar and the need for better or more uh, data points uh, under those pillars? That was a sneaky methodology question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think as Steve mentioned at the end of uh, his talk, this is the start, we hope, of a, of a conversation, and we hope to add indicators to the index and refine the data over the years. I mean, the EIU, as I mentioned, we do a lot of these indexes, and a lot of them add indicators in, in each iteration. I think the best example of that that I can think of off the top of my head is the Global Food Security Index, which has started, I think, maybe a bit bigger than this, but not much, and now uh, encompasses a huge number of indicators. Um, as for the rule of law question, I mean, you could, we had to make a decision. Uh, indexes, uh, ultimately you have to make a decision, otherwise it's, you're paralyzed with indecision. Um, so rule of law could really apply to any one of these, right? And any one of the sub-indicators. Uh, we put it in trade costs because this is a trade index. Um, the short answer to your question is, but the, the points you make are valid ones, yeah. It's, it's interesting, and you, you, you raise a variety of good points, and we, we've had extended conversations around a lot of those points. It's almost like you uh, were in the room with us in spirit, if not, if not in person. Um, I think the bottom line approach that we took is, look, we wanted to identify what are the most relevant indicators under each of the three pillars, and not be locked into a mode where we say, well, we had eight in one, so we have to have eight in the others. We were interested in quality and the ones that we think expressed what we were trying to express under each one of those pillars. And the key point is, at the end of the day, irrespective of how many indicators might be under each pillar, each of those pillars, at least in the baseline, is equally, is equally weighted. I'm back from a former teacher, and I don't know the methodology question. <laughs> she said that too. <laughs> no, not a hidden one, not a real one. I just don't have one. Um, first of all, I'm really impressed by the work that you've done. I think it's wonderful work, and it's very important, I think, as well, to for governments and also for companies to have another assessment to see where you want to go, where you're not going to go. On that line, 
it might be interesting because what I think you're trying to do is also get a little bit of a competition going here <laughs> for people to move up in those ranks. And so maybe it'd be interesting to have a longer indicator, some case studies, who has done extraordinarily well in one of those, and then kind of set the benchmark for everybody else to do that. And then a second one that came to mind when you were talking, of course it's always easy to have ideas when somebody else has done all the the work. Um, is it'll be interesting because I don't think that exists in Asia like a sustainable asset management kind of approach, including companies. Have a separate report where you rank companies like sustainable asset management does, but that's mainly in the Western hemisphere. Because I think companies are increasingly taking a stand in our societies. And it'd be interesting to also pressure them further to work along those. Yeah, I think in the aggregate, maybe we can do it, um, but uh, my boss is here, so I have to take pains to point out that we cannot evaluate companies. Uh, so countries, yes, individual com uh, companies, I don't think we would do that. But at the aggregate level, um, it would be an interesting, or maybe an interesting uh, approach to pursue it, yes. I, I, I think the suggestion on the extended case studies is a very good one and something uh, worth considering. And in terms of uh, having a, creating a competition between countries, I guess we'd only say that we would be pleased if countries found inspiration <laughs> from the events.